Hello, this is Sharon, reading to you from The Shaking by John Noble, turning the church inside out to turn the world upside down. Today we're reading from chapter 20, which is entitled Stop the Damned Division. The Sacrament of Unity and Love, St. Fulgentius of Rusp. We who are many are one body, since we all share the same bread. And so we pray that by the same grace which made the Church Christ's body, all its members may remain firm in the unity of that body through the enduring bond of love. We are right to pray that this may be brought about in us through the gift of one Spirit, of the Father and the Son. The Holy Trinity, the one true God, is of its nature unity, equality and love, and by one divine activity sanctifies its adopted sons. That is why scripture says that God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit he has given us. The Holy Spirit, who is the one Spirit of the Father and the Son, produces in those to whom he gives the grace of divine adoption the same effect as he received amongst those whom the Acts of the Apostles described as having received the Holy Spirit. We are told that the company of those who believed were of one heart and soul, because the one Spirit of the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is one God, had created a single heart and soul in all those who believed. This is why St. Paul, in his exhortation to the Ephesians, says that this spiritual unity in the bond of peace must be carefully preserved. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, he writes, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, with all humility and meekness and with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit. And that extract comes from a book addressed to Monomus. Crippling Division Division amongst Christians is the single biggest hindrance to the church completing a mission to reach all peoples with the good news. This corporate objective, lovingly but firmly laid on us by Jesus, is achievable in one generation if we cooperate. Jesus said, Every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Who says he was wrong? One of the great divides in the church's development in England was between Celtic and Roman Christians. Chris Seaton describes in his New Celts, written with Roger Ellis, Kingsway, It's my conviction that the Roman emphasis on order and maintenance, combined with the Celtic emphasis on freedom and mission, could have seriously affected this nation for good. Chris comments on this. The possibility of the Celtic and Roman wells working for the same goals offers an awesome prospect in hindsight. The strength of the eastern and western expressions of church could both have been expressed in these islands. Order and energy, discipline and wandering, structure and freedom hand in hand would have been a dynamic mix. Similarly, I wonder what might have happened had Wesley and Whitfield been fully united in their efforts to evangelise these islands. Would the combination of their gifts and understanding have produced a living stream that would have gone on to even greater things? Neither the Celts nor Whitfield left behind a continuing expression of their ministry, whereas the Romans and Wesley left structures with mixed blessings, but at least there's something to restore. Apart from a few sacrificial saints over the centuries, the Church would have failed with its history of infighting, division or conflicting vision, ultimately destroys any house which allows it to continue. The body of Christ is no exception. If the members are at war, it is impossible for Jesus the head to coordinate his body. However, unity is not something we want in order to succeed. Unity is the outcome and evidence of a right response to Jesus. It is fundamental to our life in God and is of value in itself. Jesus is worthy of our expressions of it. Amazing Facts after 100 years of Christianity, the ratio of non-Christians to Christians worldwide was approximately 360 to 1. By the end of the first millennium, it had dropped to around 220 to 1, and by 1990 it had reached a staggering 7 to 1. And we're not talking nominal Christians. If that were the case, it would be almost 3 to 1. These amazing statistics are down to the power of our message and the determination of small sections of the church, many who died as martyrs. In fact, there were more Christian martyrs in the last century alone than in the rest of the church's history. As I write, the church in some countries is suffering massive persecution and wholesale slaughter. Strangely, these are often the areas of greatest growth. 
Concerning the unreached, in AD 100 there was just one church for every 12 unreached groups. Each church would have had to send 12 missionaries for each unreached group to have one worker. Today there are 600 churches for every unreached group and we would only need to increase giving by 0.01% to resource the 48,000 missionaries needed to send four workers to each unreached people. These statistics do not account for the huge growth amongst Charismatics and Pentecostals, by far the fastest growing movements in the worldwide church. In 1900 there were no more than 4 million, whereas today there are over 500 million. In other words, almost 10% of the world's population has experienced a powerful baptism in the Holy Spirit. The task of world mission is well within our reach, if we focus on the central issues which unite us. Unity of Spirit Why is it, with this tremendous potential, we allow the enemy to divert us? Poised on the edge of our greatest opportunity in 2,000 years, Satan convinces us that unity of doctrine is more important than unity of spirit, when it's actually the opposite. Paul pleads with the Ephesians, Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Unity of spirit is a gift to be maintained. You cannot maintain what you do not possess. Unity of faith is a process we are called to work towards. Why do sound Bible-believing Christians twist and mangle scripture? They did it over the baptism in the spirit, the nature of church, and now they tell us that a common understanding of truth comes before a common experience of the Holy Spirit. When we need the spirit to lead us into truth, So how does unity come? I'm not suggesting we compromise for unity, simply that we approach one another with kindness and generosity. Believing the best and affirming the life of Jesus wherever we see it. By all means debate, but with forbearance and patience, giving way to one another and listening carefully without a critical or cynical spirit. We'll discover that kernels of truth can be hidden by the husks of immaturity. Let me repeat. Unity is a gift of the Spirit. Paul assures us we were all baptised by one Spirit into one body. And that's 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. At the outset we are bound together in Christ. Unity of the Spirit comes by faith. We then work tirelessly to keep it through patience, honesty and tolerance. In such an atmosphere we grow and develop, learning to love and trust one another. We become interdependent, aware that every individual or group has a contribution to our corporate life and well-being. If, alongside this openness and willingness to listen, we release intercessors and peacemakers, we will have a powerful recipe for healing and reconciliation. Truth and Counter-Truth Each tradition and movement has its distinctive features and emphasis which help us to know Jesus better. Polarisation and division cause characteristics to become caricatures as we exaggerate truth to counter opposition. Exaggerated truth means that those who see the other end of God's large spectrum of truth cannot relate to us. Every truth has counter-truth which seems in conflict, but in Christ is reconciled. Mercy and judgment, or faith and works, like the wings of a bird, work in harmony for flight to take place. A wing has beauty in itself and is aerodynamic, but thrown into the air it will fall to the ground. Worse, a bird with only one wing may be very much alive and have great beauty, but it will never fly. The church is full of opinionated people and the evangelicals are the worst, because we claim scripture supports our views. The problem with scripture is that truth is hidden like precious stones or metal waiting to be mined. The key to the discovery of truth is firstly to do it with humility and secondly with relationships. We are plainly told God reveals himself to the humble and that's in Matthew 11:25. And scripture is not for private interpretation. 2 Peter 1 verse 20. Jesus also warned us that he spoke in parables so we wouldn't understand whereas we feel that parables make truth obvious. We've lost the art of seeking and the sense of mystery. Truth is reduced to a systematic theology, which can be learned and assimilated. Accuracy takes precedence over heart and practice. As Jesus pointed out, there is such a thing as being dead right, with emphasis on dead. Truth is a person. 
Jesus spoke about these people when he said, Do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Matthew 23 verse 3 So our talk may be true, but if it is not spoken in the spirit of Jesus, backed by godly practice, it's not the truth. Truth is more than words. Truth is a person incarnate in Jesus. Truth must be translated into lifestyle and mixed with grace. Truth without grace is destructive. Grace without truth is sentiment. So we need one another to represent Jesus and be salt and light in the world. Like the ordinary people who receive Jesus and his teachings with delight. Many are waiting for a fresh breeze of living truth, perfumed with the fragrance of love, to blow from the church, which historically has caused so much pain. Who sees with different eyes? As the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day saw the speck in their brother's eye and ignored the plank in their own, we can do the same. Being proud of our righteousness and failing to see goodness in others is self-righteousness, and God hates this intensely. The Lord can cope with a broken sinner, but a proud Christian is no fun to be with. A godly preacher found himself in a railway carriage with a drunk. The drunk was talkative and generous with his bottle and continually offered it to the man of God, who politely declined. After many refusals, the drunkard, full of remorse, said, "'You must think I'm a terrible sinner.' Not at all, the preacher replied. I was thinking how generous you are with something so precious to you. The Stronger Brother If only we adopt this attitude, not that we ignore sin, but our first thought is to see good in one another rather than misreading motives, mishearing words and misjudging intentions. One day the Lord will replay the videotapes and we'll be embarrassed to see how petty, obnoxious and how wrong we were in many situations. Often, in an attempt to excuse this awful critical and judgmental behaviour, we label that kind of person the weaker brother or sister. Perhaps they malign someone for drinking a glass of wine, for wearing certain clothes or holding a different view. Such a person is not the weaker brother, he is the stronger brother, and should be disciplined for his dominant controlling spirit. Oh, but we may offend him or even lose him, I hear. Sadly, these people need to be offended, and our churches might be better off without them. They're usually the reason why others who are really seeking God and are struggling to understand him do not come. Gerald Coates was preaching in a small church on law and grace. He was underlying God's kindness in how he viewed legalistic Bible reading and quiet times. Suddenly a man jumped up shouting, These young people should be up early in the morning seeking God. Gerald was taken aback and for once lost for words. The man's wife came to Gerald's aid. If that's what you believe, she said to her husband, why don't you do it then? Be sure hypocrisy will find you out. How to disagree. Disagreements are not disaster. They are an integral part of life. But we must learn how to disagree, how to be angry without sinning. Disagreement is not sin, and anger is not necessarily sin. It is how we disagree and how we express emotion which is important. Christine used to say I was nicer than God, and outside the family I had a ministry of hinting. Preach a sermon on giving and the generous will give more, but the mean will remain mean. There's nothing like being direct. I would approach people who needed discipline, apart from Christine and the children, with a super spiritual pleasantness, which meant they never heard what I was saying. One day I read, Be ye angry and sin not, Ephesians 4 verse 26, and determined to be more honest. One brother, a long-term nuisance, came to see me with his gripes. I let him have it straight, and tears filled his eyes. What have I done, I thought, ready to apologise and revert to niceness. Now I know you care, he wept. You're only honest like this with people you love. Now I feel one of the family. I'd made a friend for life. Where there is unresolved conflict, it should be natural to address it in the context of relationships in the family, among friends or in the church. Mutual submission is a scriptural principle and provides the means to deal with differences where there's love and respect. Even in the world we must accept the judgment of peers if we are called to account. How much more should we, in the church, find loving and honest ways to solve our problems? And how to divide? Even division is not sin if done in the right way. Our hero Abraham explained to his cousin Lot that because they were brothers and in order to avoid strife between their camps, it would be better to separate. But Abraham's heart was for Lot, 
and the moment his relative was in difficulty he was there to help, risking all to save him. Most of us wait until things are so bad we drive one another away by the pain we cause, and then there's little hope of reconciliation. The prodigal's father knew how to release his son. The boy was wrong, but Dad kept the cord of love intact, letting it out so, at the right time, he could pull it in again. In our disagreements, we play what I call the conscience card too soon. We use conscience to blackmail one another. Obviously, we must obey God and our conscience, but mostly we are too easily offended and our consciences are too tender. If we were God, we'd have no friends. Friendship requires love, tolerance and patience. Rediscovering the True Pastors Part of the answer to division is the restoration of the pastoral ministry of Ephesians 4. Let me explain. Just as someone who prophesies is not necessarily a prophet or someone who sings a singer, neither is someone who shows care necessarily a pastor. The gift embraces leadership as well as function and contains qualities like love, discipline, empowerment, care and feeding. We have different perceptions of the pastor. For some, a pastor leads. For other, a pastor is a counsellor, someone who cares. The image varies from a leader to one who shows concern. These models perpetuate wrong thinking and are unhelpful. I have said the words in scripture for pastor, elder, shepherd, overseer and bishop are interchangeable, but the word which most vividly describes the ministry in the English language and most powerfully expresses its function is shepherd. When Jesus was born there were shepherds, plural, abiding together in the fields. They were together in the fields watching out for one another and for their flocks. That's what pastors do. In a given location the pastors, in relationship, watch out for each other and the flocks of the one flock of God. The imagery of the shepherd runs through both testaments and study shows us how the ministry functions. Shepherds are responsible for the welfare of the whole flock, not just part of it. They are firm, not sentimental, hence the rod. They are concerned for the protection of all and will risk life and limb to ensure it. Often pastors today care more about their position than working for the good of all. They want to be in control. This is a model of leadership has been described as Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. The pastor is a beautiful person who surrounds himself with little people who are no threat. As we yield our leadership to God, he will raise up shepherds with peacemaking ministry who will work together to heal our divisions. These women and men, Christ's gift to the body, will equip the saints for the work of ministry, so the church becomes the shepherd in the community at large. Head of a Mouse It has been prophesied, the day of the streams is over, the day of the river is here. This is true, but we must play our part to make it reality. My Irish friend David Matthews, when referring to divisions amongst Protestants in Northern Ireland, said they'd rather be the head of a mouse than the tail of a lion. If God's heart for unity is to be satisfied, we must give up our independence and need to control. In coming together we provide a context where people can flourish and grow. Referring to the chart at the end of the chapter 7, if the first reformation restored the power of the word, the second restored the power of the ministry, and the third restored the power of the spirit, then this present reformation will restore the power of the people. How will this happen? For years now, I've been involved in charismatic renewal. It has been thrilling and a privilege. However, the emphasis has been typically Protestant, the baptism of the individual Christian in the Holy Spirit. Here, my personal experience of the Spirit is added to my personal salvation and helps me find my personal calling, which gives me a personal fulfilment. This is not totally unscriptural, but it's not scriptural either. The biblical teaching concerning our destiny as individuals is related to and dependent upon the rest of the people of God. We have no future outside of our relationship in the community of the redeemed. Tale of a Lion Over and over in the Acts it is recorded that the Holy Spirit fell on gathered saints. This corporate baptism is in tune with the historical picture of a gathered people coming out from the bondage of Egypt and through baptism in the Red Sea together before entering the land of promise. John's assurance, he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, would have been understood by his Jewish hearers as personal and corporate. Emmanuel means God with us, not God with me. We journey together. 
we are baptised into common joys, sufferings and hopes as one people. If I must be the tail of the lion to enjoy this, so be it. This understanding comes with baptism by the Spirit into the body and frees us from independence which focuses on my needs and ministry. Without this mindset, which has dogged the church for centuries, we become a spirit-led people, recognising all the gifts Christ has placed within the body. The impartation of this common anointing is an essential part of what God is doing in the church now, and we should pray for the Spirit to come in this way. After such blessing, those early Christians were of one heart and one soul, an unforgettable encounter which blew away their fears. Jesus had commanded his disciples to wait together in one place. In that upper room the Spirit came and the whole company received the blessing. Together they became powerful witnesses to the historic events surrounding Jesus' life and to the coming kingdom. No competition. In June 1999 I was privileged to work with a team of Martin Scott's sowing seeds for revival in the Earwash Valley, the East Midlands of England. It was Robin Hood country, but hardly the centre of the universe. The ministry encourages reconciliation, prayer and cooperation amongst leaders in key areas. For some years, a group of leaders had prayed together for revival. An Assemblies of God and a kneeling pastor, an Anglican vicar, a Baptist pastor and the leader of a church of the Nazarene. At the start, there had been suspicion and jealousy, even to the point of avoiding one another in the street. As they prayed, every morning at 6.30am, the barriers came down. God gave them real love for one another, and now they longed to see each other's churches prospering, even at their own expense. Every church in the valley, regardless of denomination, was repeatedly visited and prayed over. The spiritual temperature is rising in those depressed mining communities, and since our week with them, more leaders, including a Methodist minister, have joined to pray. Competition has been an issue for many church leaders. The second question we ask when we meet after which church is how many members. But competition is biblical. Hebrews 10 verse 24 speaks of provoking unto love and to good works. And I recall another version calls us to outdo one another in love. A sevenfold strategy to help us reach our goals. If we're to achieve our objectives of cooperation, there are things we must prayerfully keep in mind and use as a checklist to see how we're progressing. You could call it a sevenfold strategy to help us reach our goal of unity. Number one, respect identity. If you are secure in yourself, you will not pressure others to conform to your ways. You will respect their right to find God for themselves and develop their distinctives as individuals or as a group. Diversity will be encouraged and welcomed. Number two, develop relationships. Find time to nurture friendships which go beyond the necessary business of function. Eating and drinking with friends was an essential part of Jesus' life and should be a regular feature of our relationships too, along with walking, chatting and enjoying simple things together. Number three, listen to one another. Dialogue and debate are vital in the process of understanding one another's burdens and concerns, but listening is essential for real and abiding harmony. Richard Dobbins, director of Emerge Ministries in Akron, Ohio, warns married couples, don't shoot from the lip. Careless words can cost you hours of painful attempts to explain what you meant, sometimes in the middle of the night. We leaders do well to heed his wisdom. What we say in the heat of the moment is rarely what we mean. We must allow one another to retract things. James 1 verse 19 should be read before we get to, down to the serious business of sorting issues. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Number four, serve one another. Break the hierarchies and pecking orders of our structures and find ways to humbly serve. Be sensitive to one another's physical and emotional needs. Take time out to show kindness and tenderness. If your master humbled himself to wash his disciples' feet, how much more should we bless and encourage each other? Number five, invest outside your own sphere. Offering practical help and sharing resources, particularly finances, is a wonderful way of dispelling suspicions and fear. I recently heard a church in the USA which took an offering for another struggling church's building fund. They closed down their Sunday meeting and popped across to take the gift as a surprise. 
We will not be truly blessed until we invest in others outside our circle of relationships. Number six, recognise and receive from others. In the West, we tend towards paternalism. I help you, you don't help me. And Christians are worst in this respect. This leads to pride and insensitivity on the one hand and loss of dignity and wrong dependence on the other. If we are all God's children, it is possible that some of us have nothing to share. We must learn to receive from others. We will be amazed at the jewels God has placed in the lives of those different from us. Number seven, take time to network. Inbreeding produces overbred creatures with exaggerated features, weak and prone to disease. Cross-fertilisation keeps us strong and healthy. Love for the body of Christ will compel us to network across cultures, subcultures, people groups, nations, generations and denominations. Only a fool neglects part of his own body. Every member brings their special contribution. Our divisions work against a corporate baptism in the spirit and God will hold us responsible, particularly leaders. Unity draws down God's blessing like a magnet. So let's stop this damn division and come together to wait patiently for the spirit. He will come and bind our hearts and souls together in a heavenly baptism of love. Then, like those early saints, we'll be less concerned for ourselves and more concerned for the lost. Thus, turned inside out, we will, as one people, turn the world upside down. Prophetic Postscripts UK and USA During October 1999, I was attending a regular forum in the UK for apostolic team leaders. These men, sadly no women here, have known one another for years and whilst each team has its distinctives, we have a great regard for one another and enjoy genuine friendship. Our sharing reflects this love and trust and is open and honest. In the midst of reporting good things taking place, there was a concern that churches were not growing. The question was, have the new churches plateaued? In the debate, Derek Brown reminded us um, of a prophetic word attributed to the great Pentecostal revivalist Smith Wigglesworth just before he died in 1947. As he read it, a shiver of excitement ran down my spine. Could this be the moment? During the next few decades, there will be two distinct moves of the Holy Spirit across the church in Great Britain. The first move will affect every church that is open to receive it and will be characterised by a restoration of the baptism and gifts of the Holy Spirit. The second move of the Holy Spirit will result in people leaving historic churches and planting new churches. In the duration of each of these moves, the people who are involved will say, This is the great revival. But the Lord says, No, neither is the great revival, but both are steps towards it. When the new church phase is on the wane, there will be evidence in the churches something that has not been seen before. A coming together of those with an emphasis on the Word and those with an emphasis on the Spirit. When the Word and the Spirit come together, there will be the biggest movement of the Holy Spirit that the nation and indeed the world has ever seen. It will mark the beginning of a revival that will eclipse anything that has been written, witnessed within these shores, even the Wesleyan and the Welsh revivals of former years. The outpouring of God's Spirit will flow over from the UK to the mainland of Europe and from there will begin a missionary move to the ends of the earth. Just prior to this word, on the 2nd of March 1946, Charles Prince, one of the first North American healing evangelists, also prophesied before his death. The greatest revival the world has ever seen is in preparation. Before it comes, there will be a scourge of divine healers advertising their wares and dogmas. They will speak of power in their bodies and hands and of angelic visitations. The results will be the defying of man and this false move will precede the true revival and will damage the children of God almost beyond repair. Price's word implied a purging which would rid the church of commercialism, greed and restore faith in the ministry as integrity and the supernatural come together. This has been happening in the USA in recent years now, with Toronto, Pensacola and other centres of revival appearing, it seems the fires are beginning to burn. My conviction is that word and spirit, or holiness and miracles, or character and power, are the two witnesses which God requires as heralds of his kingdom. In Revelation 11 and Zechariah 4, these anointed ones, sons of fresh oil, 
embody the spirit of Moses and Elijah, the symbolic representatives of the law and the prophecy. Fully visible in Jesus' life and ministry, they are yet to be seen in fullness in his body. However, Acts 1 verse 8 confidently declares that we, God's people, shall be his witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. The church will, at some crucial point in history, become the Moses and Elijah who display the character and power of Jesus. Creation groans in anticipation of the day. This union of word and spirit will not be the combination of the worst elements of charismatic independence and desire for personal fulfilment with conservative evangelical legalism and boring biblical lecturing. That would be a disaster of monumental proportions and will never produce revival. In these prophetic words I hear God calling us to a new passion for Jesus, the living word revealed in scripture, the written word, and to a new surrender to the spirit who empowers. There's no going back. The blessing of word and spirit will come as we journey on together. You've been listening to chapter 20, taken from The Shaking by John Noble, turning the church inside out to turn the world upside down. Hello, this is Sharon, reading to you from The Shaking by John Noble, turning the church inside out to turn the world upside down. Today we're reading from chapter 21. The Warfare, Together We Stand The Feel-Good Factor Spiritual warfare is currently a subject of great interest and controversy. The question, apart from the obvious, is our practice biblical, is, has it been effective? We may have prayed, fasted, shouted at the devil and feel very fulfilled, but has it made a scrap of difference? I believe in spiritual warfare, but we must judge effectiveness by results. Business, industry and the professionals are facing the challenge of performance-related measures, yet Christians hide behind well-worn, super-spiritual excuses. Eternity alone will reveal. The truth is, eternity will reveal. It will reveal that much of our effort was born of the flesh, raised in pride and died in failure. Trouble is, some genuine saints who laboured and prayed, usually in secret and unknown, don't yet see the results of their warfare. Their names will go down as giants of intercession, but the rest of us must link our prayer to visible, tangible answers and measurable change, or we'll lose credibility. In the 1970s, when spiritual warfare was rediscovered, the saints would sing and shout in conferences, waving their arms, stamp their feet for an hour or two, and end up binding the demons over Britain. When the leaders felt they'd done enough, they'd go back to their tents feeling better and have a nice cup of tea. Problem was... They'd end up shouting, quietly because of the family in the next tent, waving their arms at the wife and probably belting the kids because they'd played truant from the young people's meeting. All this showed the demon responsible for the campsite had escaped the effects of the national binding prayers. Intercessors and Apostolic Leadership The situation polarised the charismatic movement into super-real pragmatics and the so heavenly minded no earthly use intercessors. Things are changing. The intercessory movement is growing and maturing. There is a willingness for accountability and apostolic leaders are welcome to give oversight to the prayer movement. Respect between streams and a conviction concerning our need for one another will contribute to success. Ed Delf, founder of Nations, which stands for Networking Apostolic Thrust Internationally or Nationally, in Phoenix, Arizona, was speaking at an intercessory conference in Westminster, London, England, in May 1999. His message, entitled Apostolic Intercession, underlined the importance of apostolic streams giving covering to the intercessory movement. This, he believes, will release power which will affect the highest echelons of society and government. He sees the link between the prayer networks and tribal leaders as a key to breakthrough in evangelism and bringing the Bride of Christ to maturity. At our Pioneer Leaders Conference in February 2000, five South Africans from black and mixed-race churches made a deep and lasting impact by their presence, humility and contributions, which were powerful and moving. In private, Roger Patterson, pastor of Cape Town Christian Fellowship, prophesied that God longs for apostolic leaders and intercessors to work together to give oversight to the intercessors and keep them from enemy attacks provoked by their work. He warned that intercessors felt exposed, 
insufficiently supported and separated from leadership. Later, David Maniki, leader of Kolo Mission Centre in Idwata, fasted and prayed for some days in my home. The Lord gave him further revelation. The Lord was showing me something more about the prophetic responsibility of intercession and the apostolic task of building. Although there is no exclusiveness implied, it is only in Christ that both functions were equally and adequately integrated. He could truly say that he could do only what he sees the Father do and claim, what I have heard from him I tell the world. But in us, since the doing and the hearing are not normally centred in one person, it is essential that the hearing intercessors are closely linked to and listened to by the doing apostolic leaders. 24-7 Prayer At the same conference, Pete Gregg, pioneer leader, told us how the Lord had led him to start what has evolved into a worldwide prayer movement. It began after he visited the site of the 100-year prayer meeting which started in Hernhut on 13th of August 1727. Pete was convinced the Lord wanted him to initiate a 24-hour, seven-days-a-week prayer meeting for youth in his church, but couldn't believe that they'd cope even for a short period. Not only did they cope, but they carried on and became the inspiration for youth in churches around the globe. Their website is www.24-7prayer.com and you'll find everything you need to get involved. In the Roman Catholic Church, too, there is a return to emphasis on prayer. Pope John Paul II wrote with regard to prayer, Dear brother and sisters, our Christian communities must become genuine schools of prayer where meeting with Christ is expressed, not just in, in imploring help, but also in thanksgiving, praise, adoration, contemplation, listening and ardent devotion until the heart truly falls in love. Blessed Elena Gura, founder of the Oblate Sisters of the Holy Spirit, is an inspiration to many prayer and intercession initiatives. Between 1895 and 1903 she wrote 12 letters to the Pope requesting renewed preaching on the Holy Spirit and prayer. Pentecost is not over. In fact, it is continually going on in every time and in every place because the Holy Spirit desired to give himself to all men. We have only to dispose ourselves like them, first believers, to receive him well, and he will come to us as he did to them. Oh, if only unanimous and fervent prayers could be raised to heaven in every part of Christendom, as they were once in the centicle, in the upper room, of Jerusalem, for a rekindling of the Divine Spirit. The Trident As I have pondered this vital area of dealing with evil principalities and powers, I have concluded we must give the enemy a taste of his own medicine, the Trident. We must hit him with a three-pronged fork, on which, until now, he has had the monopoly, using heaven, earth and hell as terms to describe the primary influences in our lives, that is, one... God and his angels, two, people and material things, three, the devil and his demons. Let's see how the Lord wants this threefold initiative in our hands. Satan's been at work in the heavenly realm confusing communications between Christians and our commander Jesus. He has poured out unbelief and cynicism, causing some to doubt his existence and the existence of a major source of help, the angels who faithfully serve God and watch over us. He has punished us on earth through infiltration with worldliness and direct persecution. Finally, he unleashed the forces of hell, disguised as angels of light to corrupt, deceive and blind unsuspecting saints. The time's come to grasp the trident and turn it upon Satan himself. Heaven, Earth and Hell In every circumstance, the three prongs of heaven, earth and hell bring their influences to bear. Hence our question when trouble comes, was it God, was it man, or was it the devil? Those questions were on everyone's lips when Diana, Princess of Wales, tragically died on the 31st of August 1997. Did God intervene to stop a terrible mistake in the relationship with Dodie? Was it man, unscrupulous paparazzi, feeding a news-hungry public who demanded ever more titillating stories to placate their insatiable appetite for scandal? Or was it the devil who snuffed out this beautiful but strangely sad life in anger for the good she was doing? 
As always, the answer was yes to all three. Heaven, earth and hell were all at work to turn the situation for good, for personal gain or for evil. Remember Job from chapter 6? Heaven, hell and earth were playing their parts in his existence. The Lord was deeply involved with his hidden agenda to bless. Satan, burning with hatred, longed to destroy God's faithful servant. And the three friends, motivated by self-justification and blinded by ignorance, were bending Job's ear to no effect. Today the Lord calls his divided church to stand together, using the kingdom authority at our disposal. He calls us to join forces to invade our time and this generation's space with the victory he secured. To exercise his authority over powers in heavenly realms, on earth and in hell, he's given us the power if we work together. Charismatics, Social Activists and Evangelists Charismatics emphasise spiritual warfare and direct their energies towards the heavens. They have sought to engage principalities who control the territory Satan has put in their charge. Christian social activists confronted those same spirits on earth, in the structures of society where greed and injustice rule. Through these channels, Satan works his plan to bring humanity in, into subjection to himself. Evangelicals endeavour to plunder hell and release captives through preaching a gospel true to scripture. Each with the highest motives has tried to serve God and be obedient to him. Each has tended to despise the other, believing their part is of the primary importance. Such thinking must be abandoned. It is misguided arrogance. I've been amazed recently to see leading evangelicals, social activists and charismatics humbly acknowledge their ineffectiveness and affirm their need of one another with tears. I've watched them kneel in repentance, asking for prayer and forgiveness from those they have criticised. God will honour this, and every genuine movement we make towards unity. Let's use the trident to launch a simultaneous attack on the enemy through word, works and wonders, which shake the foundations of heaven, hell and earth to put Satan in retreat. The Turning Point in Revelation 12 In Revelation 12, 1 to 11, the battle turns. The woman conceives her man-child, snatched from the jaws of the dragon, is caught up to the throne. God's seat of authority. Immediately there's war in heaven. The dragon is cast down to earth with his angels. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ, the voice proclaims. The accuser of our brothers is on the run. How has this been achieved? There are different schools of thought as to the symbolism of this passage. It's been argued the woman variously represents Eve, Mary, Israel and the church. The principle of a virgin conceiving and bringing forth a deliver a child is biblical, historical and ongoing. It is in the latter sense it is expressed here as revelation opens with the promise we are to be shown what must soon come to pass. In other words, it's looking to a future fulfilment. You don't need revelation about what's already happened. So the woman is primarily a picture of the church, Christ's body on the earth, destined to give birth to an overcoming company indwelt by Jesus sharing his authority. That the man-child is a corporate group is clear from verse 11, where we're told, they, plural, overcame. This would-be company of overcomers is suddenly caught up to the throne, preoccupied with God's authority. They're not swept away to a distant space safe haven. They simply take the place reserved for them in, in this life and sit with Jesus in heavenly places. Ephesians 1 verse 3. From this position of highest authority in heaven, they visibly overpower the dragon and his angels on earth, through the victory already accomplished in hell by Jesus' death on the cross. So the battle moves from heaven to earth and finally to hell, as Satan is cast down and exposed for what he really is. Christ's salvation is revealed to break the bondage of demonic lies and accusations. This new generation of overcomers, born from the womb of the church, we discover the truth Jesus modelled, that life and power are God's gifts to those who die to self. The cross remains the only route to the throne. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. The Threefold Cord 
Our right in Christ places us in the throne room of heaven, and once there, the challenge of earth and hell are already decided. But it is a corporate overcoming company who initiate the beginning of the end. The three prongs of the trident working in unison finally dislodge the enemy. To change the analogy, in the words of Ecclesiastes, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. The trident is a powerful weapon, and a threefold cord is extremely strong. A united effort by charismatics, social activists and evangelicals is what the Holy Spirit has been working for through renewal, restoration and revival. Personal renewal puts us in a right relationship to God, that's heaven in our hearts. Church restoration puts us in a right relationship to one another, that's glory on earth. And revival breaks demonic powers, that's hell open for prisoners to go free. Intercession, justice and proclamation working hand in hand will trigger God's final shakings in the heavens on earth and in hell itself. Surprise compliment. Pioneer People, the church I'm part of now, has been around for three decades. It has a wonderful history since it was planted by Gerald Coates. This church, and indeed the whole Pioneer Network, has been facing the challenge of implementing the change I'm writing about and inevitably there is pain. Our self-image became tarnished, but the Lord is good. Into this turbulent period, the Lord sent one of his angels, Brennan Manning, a Roman Catholic from the USA. Brennan, orphan of the Ragamuffin Gospel, has a special way of introducing Abba Daddy, our father, who was at the core of Jesus' relationship with heaven and constantly upheld him through every test. It is obvious Brennan shares this intimate knowledge of the father. It shines out. In his final address, he encouraged us with these words, which surprised many embroiled in the important and painful business of change. In the ten days I've spent here, you've treated me like Jesus. You've shown me such incredible hospitality, such a non-judgmental acceptance of a Roman Catholic, a sense of gentleness, such kindness. The signs of welcome that have abounded made me feel like I had known you for years, like I'm one of the pioneer people. I can truthfully say I have been stunned by it. I have wept at night that somebody would make a fuss over me. This is the only time in all my travels I have ever seen a Christ-centred, charismatic, spiritually wedded to a deep concern for social justice, for social action, for Kosovo, for concern for the poor. I have been thrilled to see the whole gospel brought together, the love of God and the love of neighbour. The second thing that has struck me forcefully and humbled me is the utter seriousness. I don't mean being solemn, there's a great deal of laughter in your community, but the seriousness about loving Jesus and following him, cost what it may. This has been such a life-giving, such a rich experience for me. I ask the Lord to bless you. It was a revelation, the threefold cord of word, works and wonders, was to some degree at least woven into the fabric of our lives. If we can hold together in love and commitment, we will impact the territory God has entrusted to us. Crisis and process. There are two ways of retrieving territory, by crisis or by process. Crisis moves the one in control, process takes the ground inch by inch. Both are recognised tactics of regular warfare. Whichever is successful, the other will need to be action to follow up. Take out the leader and those dominated by him must be made aware, even convinced, of the new situation. Take an error street by street and at some point the leader must be removed to secure the victory. Process and crisis are equally important if we are to see towns, cities, regions and even nations cleared and released from oppressive influences of demonic powers. If through fasting, intercession and challenging injustice we break the demonic stronghold in an area, that's a major crisis victory. The effect should immediately be felt in a change of atmosphere and a new openness to the gospel. However, if we do not see that breakthrough, we should continue the process, taking ground little by little, household by household, street by street. Putting my own life in order, I wrest the territory of my soul from the enemy's grip. If I do the same in my family, I claim more ground. Prayer walking my street and bringing reconciliation amongst neighbours is another step. Moving on to school and workplace broadens the claw back and marginalised ruling principalities. The more people who are involved in claiming ground like this, the greater the impact. 
In this way, Wesleyan revival saved Britain from bloody revolutions such as took place in France. Can a nation be changed? Yes, nations can be changed by crisis or process, but most effectively by the two working at every level, in heaven, on earth and in hell. Many in the UK look back on the 1960s as a dark time. Christians had been hoodwinked into believing that social action or involvement in politics was unspiritual. During those days, many biblical foundations of government were undermined, and new legislation opened the door to the immorality, corruption and evil practices which abound today. Moving the goalposts Now we were more aware and a growing number of Christian agents help monitor and lobby politicians, local governments and corporations. This is good news, but our enemy, master tactician as he is, has moved the goalposts. Whilst we tinker around with matters of national concern and internal interest, he has been at work infiltrating corridors of power in Europe and the UN. We are not now asleep, but we fail to notice that the game is being played on a different field. Plans are in place for a new all-embracing super-religion which will marginalise non-kosher churches and Christian organisations. Dirk Patterson, Christian Solidarity Worldwide, exposes this in a paper, Cults and the European Union, a reflection for UK churches. What is planned will limit our activities as Christians, erode what remnants of family life remain and undermine our godly values. We're beginning to experience the effects in Europe and the USA in discrimination against Christians. This is seen in education. What we're allowed to teach our children, sex education and restrictions on prayer, the matter of adoption, who is suitable, the use of buildings, noise in worship and who we're allowed to employ. There is also positive discrimination towards people of other faiths. Thank God for those who are alerting us to what is going on. Pete Gardner with Global Focus is one such lonely watchman, prayer walking the corridors of power in the UN and global governance forums. He is mobilising Christians and it's looking to lobby committees, advisory groups and organisations responsible for the development of future policy and international law. He also provides opportunities for prayer on site at key international events. It may be too late. I believe the die is cast and a global controller is inevitable. Nevertheless, we must sound the alarm and uncover the plot so people can choose who and what they'll serve. After all, Joel prophesies, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Decisions can only be made when facts are to hand. Together we can win. It's a real battle, and there are casualties and painful losses. Jesus said he was sending us out as lambs among wolves. If he was reviled and persecuted, we must expect the same. But the battle is not between Jesus and the devil, for there's no contest here. The Lord is always in control. At his lowest, when he laid aside heavenly power to become man, he won the day. In death, he disarmed the devil and his hosts, leading them captive and making them subjects of mocking and ridicule. On the contrary, the battle is for the souls of men. Don't lose sight of this. Our warfare is not for ourselves. We are secure. Born of the Spirit, we work out our soul's salvation with fear and trembling. We have eternal life. We battle on behalf of others, as Jesus did, to put the power to choose life in their hands. Together, evangelicals, social activists and charismatics present a formidable challenge to the one who holds men's souls in his web of lies and deceit. United with the example of Jesus and the power of his spirit, we oust Satan from his heavenly pedestal, expose him on earth, and will see him cast into hell fire, reserved for him and his angels. Bound together as a threefold cord, our strength is unbreakable. Our distinctives work side by side as a trident to see our enemy dislodged. The chart below shows the reality of the tremendous power harnessed when Christians are united in diversity. I don't wish to oversimplify or typecast the streams, but the more we flow together, the more we affirm one another's emphasis is, the more we become the river whose streams make glad the city of God. This reading was brought to you from The Shaking by John Noble, turning the church inside out to turn the world upside down. Hello, this is Sharon, reading to you from The Shaking by John Noble, Turning the church inside out to turn the world upside down. 
We're reading from the last chapter today, chapter 22, and it's entitled, It's Better Caught Than Taught, It's Better Felt Than Telt. Church, the Holy Virus The end is in sight, God's final shakings have begun. The church will emerge, reshaped and revitalised, to live her finest hour as God's agents for the kingdom. The questions which remain are, what part will I play in the climax of history? And what part will those with whom I work and worship have in the grand finale? The end is all about Jesus and his triumphant return to earth, first in spirit amongst his people who prepare the way, then in flesh for every eye to see. What a privilege to call nations to their destiny in Christ and invite them to line the route of his return, welcoming the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to his rightful place as head of his church and governor to the universe. To achieve this honour and fulfil our calling to herald Christ's coming, we must nurture this fresh way of understanding church. We must allow the spirit freedom to break habits and mindsets which keep us bound to old ways largely irrelevant in our world today. We must see church as a holy virus to be caught before it's taught. In the words of the old Scots saying, It's better felt than telt. Once infected, we'll never be the same again. Time is short, but God is not in panic mode. It takes only a remnant to return and rebuild Jerusalem. Or a Gideon's band of 300 battle-wise troops to bring down the hosts of Midian. Fear and folly leave the few. As with Gideon's main army, fear or folly can disqualify. 22,000 fighting men were dismissed because they trembled. 9,700 who ran to drink with no thought of enemy presence were also turned away. Only those who cut their hands, watchful for danger, could be trusted. We too must perish beyond mere freedom from the paralysis of fear to sharpen our awareness of the enemy and gain an irrepressible determination to win. Only those who have felt God's passion for the world, his heartbeat for the lost, will participate in the big showdown. Talking the language of Zion is not enough. We must have seen the promised land. A story around at the time of that amazing Broadway musical South Pacific illustrates this point. The demand for tickets left hundreds of people desperate. Some would travel thousands of miles to pick up a cancellation. The number of the disappointed grew day by day, and some could hardly face friends and family having to admit they'd failed to get a seat. Canny ticket touts plugged into this market. Scouring the theatre at the end of each performance, they found ticket stubs and programmes to sell to these unfortunate folk, who could go back with evidence to tell the story of what they'd seen. Sadly, there are Christians too who live on the experience of others. They've got a programme and ticket stubs, but they've never seen the show. With no real understanding, they're like tourists bustled from one important site to another without absorbing the atmosphere of the place. The memory soon fades and there's nothing to draw them back again. They are virtual reality Christians, almost, but not quite. Jesus said, I am the truth, the reality. Knowing him and sharing his longings are the only ways to engage for the long haul, or in Bible speak, to endure to the end. What do you see? The prophets lived on visions. Over and over they were questioned, What do you see? What they had seen motivated them. Their visions caused fire in their bones. They had no rest until they accomplished their tasks. They were seers. Now we, the Church of Christ, are seers. We are God's prophet or prophetic people today, and without vision we will perish. We will utterly fail to complete the work God has given us to do. So how do we receive and nurture vision that will sustain us from youth even to old age? What is it that, once seen, will hold us together in all our diversity to run the race and finish the course? Zechariah had a vision. The main theme of his prophecy is the second coming of Jesus. His name means, The Lord Remembers, and has particular reverence for us. He is like the church, asleep and dreaming. The angel awakens him and demands, What do you see? In his dreams he saw a solid candlestick of pure beaten gold. Today the Holy Spirit shakes the church to awaken us. He has come to show us Jesus, the light of the world. Only a vision of Jesus gives us strength, courage and endurance to fulfil the great commission to reach all peoples with the good news. Jesus is the golden candlestick of beaten work in Zechariah's dream, a symbol of suffering divinity and illumination. 
It is Jesus bruised and beaten through whom the light of God shines in a dark world to enlighten our lives. Every hammer blow, dent, becomes a tiny mirror reflecting Father's love. Those who see cannot be shaken. This is the vision to keep alive. Never lose sight of Jesus. As Elisha fixed his eyes on Elijah, determined to obtain a double blessing, and smitten Israelites gazed on the serpent of bronze lifted up in the wilderness, so we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Those who fear the Lord have nothing else to fear, and those shaken by him can be shaken by nothing else. The psalmist knew this and exclaimed, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken but endures for ever. Campbell McAlpine, another father of the charismatic renewal, repeatedly reminded us young would-be leaders, there are 365 fear knots in the scriptures, one for every day of the year. Isaiah, when describing what he saw of the future, cried, Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Quite the reverse of what he saw for the future of the world and its injustices. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. As sure as the rising sun, God's judgments are coming. There's no escape. As Noah faced the earth-cleansing flood, we will face the purifying fire. However, we have an ark more secure than his trusty vestal, and a future more bright than his brave new world to make us through the purging. They are a holy people. Peter's second epistle warns in the last days scoffers will mock and question the promise of Jesus' coming. He continues... But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of the righteousness tested and tried in the fire as jesus baptizes us with the holy spirit and fire and we received his correct judgments nothing will remain for the final fires to burn paul confirms whatever we build on the foundation of jesus will be tested be it gold silver costly stones wood hay or straw a man's work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light it will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work Later, concerning conduct at the Lord's Supper, he advises, A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. If we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined, so that we will not be condemned with the world. For us, God's judgments are remedial. They are life and health. For the unrepentant, sold out to wickedness, they are all-consuming. What kind of people? Those who have seen Jesus and understand that his testimony is the spirit of prophecy will live holy lives, aware of the urgency of the days. Many Christians who feel they have revelation of the meaning of prophecy are arrogant and judgmental, which is out of character with Jesus and the spirit of prophecy. They delight in knowledge rather than a change of heart that nurtures a fear of God and love for their fellow man. We must conclude that even if they are right, which is unlikely, they have missed the point. If we know what is about to take place, we should heed Peter's question. What kind of people ought you to be? Having an understanding of prophecy will result in us being altogether different, a people representing Jesus in character and power. Perhaps he was referring to such a people when he said, This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. The Generation of Jesus Christ 
Jesus is the last Adam and the first being of a totally new creation. Does it mean that the beginning of the generation he was referring to in Matthew 24 verse 34 and all who are born of his spirit are part of this generation of Jesus Christ? Verse 1 of Matthew's Gospel reads, The book of the generation, Greek Genesis, of Jesus Christ. We then have the 28 generations leading to his birth spanning 2,000 years. This is the record of those who, prior to Jesus' birth, were included in his Genesis by faith. The Gospels do not simply record Jesus' pedigree in history. They are also a prophetic statement of how this one, who never had a wife or sired a child, is bringing many sons to glory. They reveal the secrets of his history future, from his resurrection over 2,000 years ago to the present day. These sons, you, me, and all women and men who humbly bow to him, are the continuing generation that will not pass away until everything is accomplished. This is the chosen generation Peter refers to in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, who are kings and priests, the holy nation that belongs to God, carrying on the work Jesus began in the same spirit of humility and power. The candlestick Zechariah saw, symbolic of Jesus, is also a symbol of the church. This is seen in Revelation 1, where seven candlesticks are seven churches. Jesus plainly told his followers, You are the light of the world. Candlesticks in Bible times were fueled by oil, the symbol of the Spirit as opposed to human power. When we receive Christ and are baptized in the Holy Spirit, we are connected to the same unending oil supply as Jesus. We share the gold of his divine nature and the power to illuminate this dark world. We too are a candlestick of beaten work and therefore will be bruised. Through persecution we will continue to reveal his dying love to the world. Out in the open and on the move. What better place to close than the simple commission of Jesus to let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. These words sum up all we've been saying about the kind of church he's looking for today. Let's desert our ghettos to be a city set on the hill which cannot be hidden. Let's take our lamps from under the bowls and place them on the stand where they can be seen. Let's stop trying to tempt people into our buildings and break out into take the living building of our relationship to the people. Let's be moving mobile family on the road with Jesus where he spent his time in ministry. Let's join him where he is rather than trying unsuccessfully to persuade him to join us where we are. It is happening. The pillar of fire has moved and more of God's children are moving with it. God's shaking is stirring us from our dreams so we step into reality. It's make or break time and our reactions will determine whether we are part of Nehemiah's remnant which returns. Not everyone will respond. Some prefer the dubious comfort of the ghetto to the excitement of the journey. But for those who have ears to hear, there is a sound of marching feet as the tribes begin to gather for the final stage of our journey to the city whose maker, builder, is God, the new Jerusalem, the mother of us all. I leave you with Ronnie Wilson's great hymn, a product of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit which gave birth to the house church movement in Britain, a movement which today faces the same challenge we accepted all those years ago. Will we continue as pioneers or will we yield to the pressures to settle? Pioneers or settlers, which will it be? I hear the sound of rustling in the leaves of the trees. The Spirit of the Lord has come down on the earth. The church that seemed in slumber has now risen from its knees and dry bones are responding with the fruits of new birth. Oh, this is the time now for declaration. The word will go to all men everywhere. The church is here for the healing of the nations. Behold the day of Jesus drawing near. My tongue will be the pen of the ready writer and what the Father gives to me I'll sing. I only want to be his breath. I only want to glorify the King. And all around the world the body waits expectantly. The promise of the Father is now ready to fall. The watchmen on the tower all exhort us to prepare, and the church responds, a people who will answer the call. And this is not a phase which is passing. It's the start of an age that is to come. And where is the wise man and the scoffer? Before the face of Jesus they are dumb. A body now prepared by God and ready for war. The prompting of the Spirit is our word of command. 
We rise, a mighty army, at the bidding of the Lord. The devils see and fear, for their time is at hand. And children of the Lord hear our commission, that we should love and serve our God as one. The Spirit won't be hindered by division. In the perfect work of Jesus has begun. That reading was taken from The Shaking by John Noble, turning the church inside out to turn the world upside down.